a, a not very normal route. I, I got into crypto via the route of cooperatives and local money and social money and this kind of thing. And uh, then I heard about Bitcoin um, around about the, the financial crisis in 2000. Well, the financial crisis happened 2007, 2008. Um, and basically everything was crashing and they started printing money then basically and they've been printing money governments have been printing money at an incredible rate ever since then um, the problem is that obviously this is like not great monetary policy because it's not backed by anything so ideally you want uh, the money printed to be backed by actual goods and services in the economy um, but in order to kind of kick the can down the road and those politicians who made those decisions to not have to take responsibility, they just started printing money. And you've ended up with now the inflation is starting to happen. You're getting very um, brutal inflation because there's just too much money in the in the economy. And most of that money went to very rich people. So you've got a problem of inequality. So this person or people called Satoshi Nakamoto um, back in 2000 and 2008, 2009, uh, started designing this um, currency, uh, which became Bitcoin. So um, that, that solved a, a very hard problem of how to make, how to do money without a centralized authority. So how to do uh, banking without a bank. So um, Bitcoin is actually secured by the members of the network. And it, it is, I mean, everything I'm going to say now is, um, there's always more and more complicated levels, but that, that's that's what it is essentially, is that it is um, a secure ledger or database which is secured by all the members of the network. So after Bitcoin, um, then Ethereum came along, which is the same kind of idea, um, but instead of just being money, it's using that that decentralized database to create a distributed computing platform. So you can think of Ethereum as uh, a massive computer, a very slow and expensive computer, but also a very, very secure computer, which um, when you put information into it, it stays in there. Like you can't deny what, what once it's on the blockchain, once information is on a blockchain, it's on there forever. Um, so so that, that's a very useful thing to have uh, because for example, if you want to copyright something or you want to prove that a thing happened when you say it happened, it's very useful to have many thousands of people verifying uh, in a decentralized way with um, without a central authority, which may become corrupted. It's, it's very useful to have a decentralized way of verifying that this, this thing happened. It can be transactions. Of course, money is a very, um, it's very useful for money because um, if I buy a Coca-Cola, um, it's good to know that the money has gone out of my account and it's got into the person selling the Coca-Cola's account. Um, so so that's that's a very obvious uh, use of it, but there's many other uses. And so Ethereum was developed out of the idea of Bitcoin, but to create a different um, different applications for this kind of blockchain technology. Um, one of the main criticisms, which is a totally valid criticism of blockchain, is that it uses a lot of energy and it's therefore... A bit of an ecological disaster, um, which which it is. It, um, but I'm, I must say that blockchains themselves um, are not uh, inherently uh, energy hungry. Uh, it's just that Bitcoin, the way Bitcoin was was designed, um, the network is secured um, by many many computers solving very difficult equations. This this uses a lot of electricity. Uh, but there, there are other ways of securing the network. So uh, currently Ethereum is going through what is known as the merge, uh, where Ethereum is going from this very energy hungry way of um, doing a blockchain into a much less energy hungry way of doing it, which is called proof of stake. Um, and so that probably even this month that is going to take place. So yeah, Bitcoin will always use a lot of energy. Um, unless something very unforeseen happens. But Ethereum from probably this month onwards uh, is going to use only about 1% of the energy that it's currently using. So they, they have actually realized that is, a, that is a real problem and they did something about it. And there are also many other blockchains, for example, 
um, Cosmos that Antonio is showing us in this course uh, is a very low energy blockchain. So that that is not necessarily a problem with every blockchain or every cryptocurrency. So, so yeah, just a very quick run through the philosophy of, of cryptocurrency. Um, all blockchain software is open source. Um, so that means you can you can take Bitcoin, change a couple of things, call it whatever you want, and you've got a new cryptocurrency. Or you can take Ethereum, uh, change it to be how you want it to be, um, and then call it something else, and, the, and you've made another cryptocurrency. So this, is, this makes it a very um, kind of agile way of doing things. It makes it... Um, very um, very easy to, to create new versions of it. Um, Bitcoin is originally based uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, the personal people who designed Bitcoin, uh, was into Austrian economics. So that basically means sound money. You can't just keep printing money. Um, it favors scarcity rather than printing loads of new money, uh, as if as if Bitcoin was digital gold, basically. So it, with gold, there's a scarce amount, and um, that has it, its own properties. Uh, people who swear by Austrian economics hark back to the time when everything was on the gold standard. Uh, in fact, that did have its own problems, but they, they thought that was better than what we have now, where governments could just go into endless amounts of debt, and someone else in the future has to pay for it. So, so that's the kind of... Um, economic position they have, which is a, basically a kind of uh, ultra libertarian position of uh, you're supposed to be responsible with money and government shouldn't have too much power. And yeah, it, there's a whole rabbit hole there as well. Um, the thing is, when, when you have a fixed supply of something and it's in demand, that means the value goes up. Uh, if the demand falls, the value goes down because the supply doesn't uh, expand and contract to meet the, the demand or lack of it. Um, and so this means that the value of most cryptocurrencies is volatile because there's a fixed supply. Uh, most of them are still coming off the template of Bitcoin. And so there's a fixed supply. Um, and that means that um, the value is generally volatile, which means that you can bet on it. So you can buy it when it's low and hope that it gets high. And a lot of people who were mining Bitcoin back in 2012, 2013 on their home computers uh, have got very, very rich um, because some people mined thousands of Bitcoin back in the day. And, you know, at one point it was worth $60,000 for one Bitcoin and they had thousands. Uh, conversely, a lot of other people um, mortgaged their house, bought Bitcoin right at the top. It went right down and they lost the whole thing. So it is a bit of a casino. Um, crypto basically started with centralized exchanges, things like Coinbase. Um, and then we, we, we then got on to um, a more automated version, which uh, doesn't involve any sort of centralized exchange for trading between different cryptocurrencies. Obviously, when there was only Bitcoin, there was you only needed to trade it for fiat, like normal money. Um, but once you had Ethereum and then Ethereum spawned loads and loads of other uh, different coins. Um, and so when you've got many, many coins, you need a way of trading between the coins. So that, that is centralized exchanges. Obviously, things like Coinbase and uh, Kraken and this kind of thing still exist. And that's easier for people who are novices. Um, but then um, gradually DeFi, uh, which is decentralized finance, uh, gradually grew out of that. So I'll just stop here in case there's any questions. Uh, what yeah. So far. yeah, I have a few questions. Yeah. So, um, okay, first Bitcoin. So it's yeah. there's a fixed quantity of it. Yeah. And how how does it get distributed? How does it get created? Be created. Um, it's created by what are called miners. So that okay. that's. That's generally like uh, big computers uh, in places where they have very cheap electricity. So somewhere like some places in China where they've got hydroelectric uh, electricity uh, and it's virtually free or sometimes it even is free. Uh, or in Iceland where they've got geothermal, they've got these big computers 
and these are solving the algorithms um, which are securing the Bitcoin network. So um, it's basically it's, it's become kind of centralized because before you everyone could mine it on their home computer, and then it became a sort of uh, race for who could solve the equation quickest because they get paid in Bitcoin when they solve these equations. You see, and when when the value of Bitcoin went up, it, it became uh, worthwhile to um, to to buy very expensive computers uh, because it was still profitable. Um, what what kind of what kind of equation? Uh, well, I, I don't really want to go into like the whole like what is a blockchain and and how is it secured. It's very very complicated, and I, I so, think it's going to start. What, um, what, um, no, 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 don't do that. But what were, what are the equations for? Are they for the creation of the blockchain itself? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so part, basically, part of the, part of the no, equations no. is uh, verifying the transactions. So, um, if you and I exchange value using the Bitcoin network, um, everyone else on that network who's well. I don't, I, again, I don't want to get too complicated, but everyone else on the network has to verify that we made that transaction and then the miners kind of stamp it at the end saying, yes, that's correct. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, so all, the, it's all verified by all the computers on the network and then, and then verified by the miners in the end. Okay, okay. so then the miners, miners create new Bitcoin out of nothing because of this. Nothing. Yes. Correct. For themselves. Uh, well, a, a little bit of it goes to themselves. It's a bit like uh, they have to solve this equation in, in a kind of competition. And then the one who does it the quickest gets a reward paid in Bitcoin. So the faster the computer you've got, the more so, likely it is that you'll solve the equation. And then you get the reward. So the, okay, so the quantity of Bitcoin, then it's not mixed, it's increasing everything. Uh, it's up to a limit. So they, they are, they're still being created. Um, okay. The equations get more difficult every, every time that an equation is solved. Uh, the next equation gets slightly more difficult, so they're getting more and more difficult. You need more and more computing power. Eventually, the equations will be so massively complicated that unless you have a quantum computer or like the you know the absolute fastest computer in the world, it'll take ages to solve that equation. Until finally, the, then the, there is a limit. There's a limit of 21 million. When 21 million bitcoins exist, uh, then it stops. Then uh, the miners go out of business, and there's no more bitcoins. Okay. And what about what about, what about Ethereum? Ethereum? Is that, that, that the same, same idea? idea? Uh, it's basically the same idea, but uh, th the supply of Ethereum isn't entirely limited. So there's a, there's a little bit of give and take with Ethereum. Um, I think there's a sort of ballpark figure that it doesn't want to go too much over, but it's a bit there's a bit more. Kind of given the system with Ethereum. And um, um, who, who initiated? I mean, I know that Satoshi is kind of anonymous, anonymous, right? Right. So nobody, yes. nobody knows behind nobody it. Nobody knows who that is. Yeah. yeah. But who is behind Ethereum? Ethereum. Um, who is behind Ethereum? Um, yeah. It was a group of people. They're not anonymous. Uh, it's Vitalik Buterin. Is a Canadian guy. A very young guy. Mm -hmm. Still only. Not even 30 yet. Um, yeah, Chad said um, Ethereum is moving to proof of stake. So proof of stake is a different way of doing things. And that means that people get to choose uh, validators who are going to validate the transactions. And those, those validators get paid uh, for doing the validation. And they have to actually stake their Ethereum coins. Um, and when you stake a certain amount of coins, you get to be a validator and then you get paid for doing that. So that, that's a different way okay, of doing okay. it. Currently, Ethereum works in the same way as Bitcoin, the proof of work. But uh, later on this month, it will be proof of stake. Uh, okay, okay. But before, before that, that, I'm just curious. curious. Um, um, so there's, there's this Vitaly, Vitaly, whatever. whatever uh, Vitalik Buterin, yeah, and some yeah, other yeah, people. Yeah. And some and other some people. Other people. Um, um, who, who are they? Who are they funded by? Uh, they they weren't funded by anyone. Money. Okay, okay. It, it it was just a it was just a protocol. I think they just did it in university. You know, maybe the university. So, 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 so,
Uh, not, not to set up, no, because it's just um, it's a software program. All, all cryptocurrency are just different software programs. I mean, I'm sure some of the more recent ones have been very expensive to do because they had to hire loads of developers and this kind of thing. But yeah, the, the original ones, it's just been built up gradually. So um, that they, they were not expensive to to launch initially, no. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, for now, for now, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I will continue. Um, okay, so, so yeah, so we had um, cent centralized finance, um, which is, let's say, normal finance, normal finance with dollars and government money. Um, and you could also say that um, cryptocurrency exchanges uh, like Coinbase or Binance, this kind of thing, is, is also centralized, although it's using cryptocurrency. So after that, um, we got decentralized finance. So what is, it's known as DeFi. So what is DeFi? Um, it's basically a bank with no bankers. So it's um, a bank, but it's, it's a software program basically, or various different software programs interacting between each other. Um, so it's a completely decentralized system. Uh, there, there's no central authority saying you can or can't do this. Obviously, the government is trying to re uh, regulate it now, uh, but it is, it is essentially a, a decentralized uh, system. Um, so, yeah, what, what Antonio was explaining yesterday was um, you can actually lend to other people uh, in this decentralized way. So you can actually send your crypto money to the, um, the DeFi program and it will keep it in a kind of bank account that they call a liquidity pool. And then, so you've got all this money in this, uh, in this bank account and then other people can come along and say, uh, I want to borrow some of that money um and they just they do it they don't need permission what they do need is collateral so most loans uh in in DeFi use um double the collateral so if you want to borrow 50 dollars, you've got to have a hundred dollars as collateral um and so if you don't pay it back you've actually lost double what you what you paid for it of course then the question is why do that why not just keep the hundred dollars yeah that's another whole rabbit hole <laughs> That I won't go into. There are reasons for doing it, but I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go down there. But um, basically, you can you can lend to these pools, and you get paid for doing so. So you get a kind of interest um, because they charge fees for people using the pools for various different financial transactions, and the fees go towards pay. <coughs> excuse me, go towards paying the people who put the money in there. So. So this is a way of making money uh, for a lot of people, especially people, for example, who made it very rich when they um, were mining Bitcoin on their home computer and now it's worth a fortune, or they bought Ethereum very, very early and they've got loads and loads of Ethereum, they don't know what to do with it. They often put it in these liquidity pools and then they just get money uh, for basically doing nothing. They just leave it in there and they get paid for for putting it in there. There's, there's, a, there's some amount of risk for putting it in there. Um, and so they get compensated for, for doing that. Um, now that this, this whole world DeFi does get very, very complicated very, very quickly. Um, and I, I don't uh, recommend unless someone's got a lot of time and desire to do this, I don't recommend in general getting involved in it. Um, it does tend towards being a casino to being degenerates and gamblers and people trying to make a quick buck and if you don't know all the ins and outs of it um, they will make a quick buck off you um, so there's a lot of scams and bullshit and you know it's kind of wild west but which is why they're trying to regulate it governments are trying to regulate it especially US government Chinese government and so on they're trying to re regulate it because there are a lot of scams there are, there is a lot of um, you know, tricky stuff that you probably don't want to get involved in. But having said that, 
and the reason why um, I continue to be interested in this is that it is a very good way of raising a lot of money very, very quickly. So as an example, last year, um, a copy of the US Constitution came up for sale in an auction. Um, and it was like, a, you know, a the copy of the US Constitution, the original one came up for, for sale in an auction. Um, and so this, uh, this group came together using DeFi, and they raised uh, $40 million in two or three days, I think it was less than a week, certainly. Um, that was called Constitution DAO. Um, so DAO is decentralized autonomous organization. So they, they made one of these organizations and they managed to pull $40 million to buy this copy of the constitution in just a very short amount of time, which would have been absolutely impossible to do uh, previous uh, to this technology existing. They actually didn't uh, get the constitution because some like mega billionaire just bought it. Um, but even so, raising raising that amount of money was a pretty uh, kind of watershed moment for DeFi that, you know, if, if people can coordinate their efforts and come together, you can you, you can pull money and do stuff uh, in a very quick and decentralized way, which can be very interesting. If you're interested, for example, in buying land and regenerating it, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, we'll get to it now, actually, because this is this is basically refires. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, so, so in, in DeFi, DeFi basically, basically, when, yeah. when, you, when you can lend, 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 you can lend, lend money, money, money that you have to pay it back, back right? right? Yes. So how, how, do, how, do, how, do, how does that work? Um, so if, if you get the loan, uh, you, you tell them how long uh, it's going to take to pay it back. So let's say 60 days, two months. Um, if you haven't paid it back by the end of 60 days, if you haven't sent... Uh, the transaction for the loan back to the contract, back to the software. Um, they just take your collateral. So as you've okay, as you've okay. already paid double the collateral for the loan, uh, you won't want yeah. to do that. So yeah, that's, okay, that's okay. basically it. Uh, just let, 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 me, let me let me process, process this. Uh, okay, so okay, basically, basically up to you, how you how manage, you manage that, that. You're, you're, you're paying, paying back, back, right? I mean, you, Sorry, have, you, have, you have to be in charge, say, you have to be in charge, charge of your strategy for, for, for giving, 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 I mean, you I mean, have to be quite, quite, quite vague, vague, and borrow, borrow, some, 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 the, some the sound quality is getting really bad powder. I, I, I can barely hear sorry. you. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Just the it's kind of echoing and distorted and all kinds of things. I, I, I haven't had a friend's friend, micro micro but I don't know how to switch it. Switch it. Um, um, so, so, so I, I, I want to say, say if, if it's up, it's up to, you, to you how you, how pay, you pay your money, money back, back, right? right? How you yes. manage, manage yes. your okay. strategy. Okay. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Because effectively there's, there's, no, there's no human being involved. Um, you're, you're just borrowing from a contract, from an automated contract. Um, so you're not borrowing from a person. Like you, you can you can borrow like five cents if you want. It actually wouldn't make sense because there's a fee for borrowing, which would be more than five cents. But you could borrow fifty dollars. You know, you could be in a, you know, it, some somewhere in Venezuela or something, or somewhere in, you know, in Africa, and you could borrow fifty dollars. You know, you don't have to get permission to do it. You just do it. This is why it can be a, an attractive thing because, you know, with colonialism, this kind of thing, like those kind of people in, you know, in the global south are excluded from borrowing anything, essentially. Uh, of course, you've got to have double the collateral. So that's, that is another issue. They're kind of working on, uh, on kind of building some sort of trust system whereby you, you have to pay less collateral like the more you do it, but this, the, uh, at the moment it's basically like you've got to have the collateral. But anyway, yeah, it's completely it's completely decentralized, completely permissionless. So you can you can borrow as much as you want or as little as you want. 
as, as long as there's enough money in the fund, um, you can borrow all of it if you wanted to. Um, if there was a billion dollars in the fund and, and you had two billion dollars, you could borrow a billion dollars. Of course, it would leave everyone else with nothing, but they just wouldn't be able to borrow until you paid it back, basically. Okay, so I'll continue with refi. So refi, um, so DeFi is decentralized finance. Refi is regenerative finance. So there's all this money sloshing around this alternative system. And some people said, well, obviously we've got this climate crisis um, and we could do with directing some of this enormous amounts of money that are in crypto towards things like Barry Chara Regeneration Fund or, or any of the many, many projects that are out there to regenerate the earth. Um, and so, like I was saying, with the Constitution DAO, um, that, that was not a regenerative goal, but they managed to raise an enormous amount of money in a very short time. Uh, so that people thought, well, why don't we do that towards a regenerative goal? So, for example, you have um, a thing called uh, Klimadao or Klimadao, which um, basically big companies like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, this kind of thing, have made a commitment, uh, they've signed agreements to buy uh, carbon credits. Um, so they they have to buy a, every year a certain amount of carbon credits to offset the carbon that they're that they're using uh, in their normal business. And so um, KlimaDAO is buying up carbon credits. So it's getting people together who have got loads of crypto and then they're buying up carbon credits. Um, so this has the effect of making carbon credits much more expensive, but these big companies have got an agreement they have to buy these carbon credits. So what, what do they decide? They decide to pollute and generate fewer emissions in order that they don't have to buy these now much more expensive carbon credits. So in this way, you're using this um, regenerative finance mechanism to actually keep these big companies much more honest. Uh, and by driving up the price of carbon credits, they're, they're not able to buy as many. And so they have to regulate how much carbon they generate. They can't just generate masses and masses of carbon and then just buy all these super cheap carbon credits uh, to make up for it because they're now really expensive. Um, and also people investing in Klimadao also get paid for doing so. So they actually can make a profit while having this positive effect on the environment. Um, and there's another one called uh, Regen Network, which is um, rather than proof of work, as is Bitcoin or proof of stake, which Bit uh, Ethereum is going to be shortly, uh, they're doing a thing called proof of regeneration. So the money is backed with, um, with actual uh, land being regenerated. And then you have a project called Seeds, which uh, Earth Regenerators has been involved with. Um, and that is paying people to do things like start eco villages or clean up uh, rivers or take away rubbish out of natural areas. And they get people get paid with cryptocurrency for doing that kind of thing. And they do uh, grants in cryptocurrency as well. Um, so talking of the uh, Barichara Regeneration Fund, um, that is on Gitcoin. So Gitcoin is an important part of the of this refi puzzle, uh, which is crypto crowdfunding, essentially. So it's asking people to put their money that they have in crypto together and, and crowdfund it uh, towards regenerative projects. It's also towards um, open source software. It was started primarily to fund open source software developers, but now it's funding uh, climate projects as well. Uh, so the way it works on Gitcoin, and I, I'm focusing on this because I, I know that a lot of people wanted to, to understand in what way is this relevant to Earth Regenerators? Um, why, why do we need to know about refi? Well, essentially we're getting to like the point of um, how this interfaces with Earth Regenerators now. So basically, Gitcoin is an organization, a nonprofit organization. So they go around to other 
um, large organizations who, who want to uh, make donations and obviously that's tax tax deductible for them um, and they get they get a big pool of money together which is called a matching pool um, from all these big companies that want to make donations um, and then people come along um, with their various projects so uh, Barry Chara Regeneration Fund is is one of them or um, there's many other eco villages or um, climate regeneration, mangrove swamp regeneration, reforestry kind of projects. Um, and they make kind of crowdfunding campaigns and put them on the Gitcoin website. And then people come along um, with their crypto wallets and they donate to each the project they like, essentially. Um, the clever thing about it is that it uses this thing called quadratic funding, um, which sounds horribly complicated. Uh, but in actual fact, what quadratic funding really means is that this big matching pool that they um, that they were donated from large organizations is allocated um, per number of donations. So let's say you have um, a thousand people donating ten dollars and then on the other to one project and then to another project, one person donating ten thousand dollars. Now the matching pool is allocated per number of donations, not per size of donations. So the very wealthy person making a $10,000 donation to one of these projects, regenerative projects, gets some matching funds, but the project that got a thousand people donating gets a way, way bigger um, share of the matching pool. And so that it, this has the effect of minimizing the influence of very wealthy people on these, uh, this kind of economy, let's say, as a whole, and maximizing the effect of just ordinary people making very small donations um, in, a, in a more uh, decentralized way. And, and therefore it shows, um, it's, it's kind of privileging um, a, a more democratic means of funding projects then it is privileging very, very wealthy people uh, funding the things they like. And so, um, for example, today I was looking at um, Gitcoin and one of the projects, I could donate $5 and they would get $300 from the matching pool for, for my $5 donation. So essentially I've donated $305. Um, and so I can see with Earth Regenerators that, that that's a lot of people who are going to know about this Gitcoin grant. I, I, I can see that um, me donating $5 to the Barry Chara Regeneration Fund already uh, gets you $63 out of the matching pool. So I donate $5 and they've got $68 donation in total. Um, so this, this is why, even though there's you have to jump through these hoops, it's a little bit complicated to set up the wallet and this kind of thing. From a five dollar donation already you can you you get you're making a 68 dollar donation um if someone makes a hundred dollar donation i don't know how much it would be but it would be probably several hundred more dollars from the matching fund um and so that this is why it's very very interesting to especially to organizations that a need a lot of money and b already have a lot of members or have a lot of people who know about it um, you can make a very big impact with with only a small donation. So that really is um, the sort of crux of the matter of why of why Gitcoin is so clever and why it really makes sense for people to to get involved with it and to um, to get, it's it's more it's more tricky than donating on GoFundMe, let's say, where you just make a five dollar donation or whatever, and they get five dollars with your credit card. It takes thirty seconds. This you have to make the wallet and learn a little bit about crypto, but the effect you can have on the projects can be really, really significant. Um, and so they can every every couple of months uh, they do another two weeks, which they call a funding round, where they they gather another matching pool of money. And every time it's been bigger, uh, they they've donated in total millions of dollars, many many millions of dollars to um, very worthwhile projects. Um, so yeah, that, that is basically um, 
the point of this this whole thing i think so thanks for listening and are there any more questions oh thanks for this um yeah wow uh so basically i think the sort of the potential the most immediate potential let's say would be yes donating basically to to regenerative projects yeah. so that your 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 donation can gets multiplied yes or if you really i mean i know that joe has this um he says that generally crypto people his experience is that they donate more easily because they made the money more easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, I, yeah. I know people who are mining Bitcoin, like I said, in 2013, and they accidentally, basically, they were just playing around with it, and they accidentally ended up with millions of dollars, and they, they never planned to be rich, and they, they were not interested in being rich, and they think, what do I do with these millions of dollars? And it eventually it becomes a tax burden as well so they actually want to get rid of some of it and so mm. things like gitcoin are saying like give it here you know we, we we'll get all these projects together um and you can give it to them you know and how do you convert it to, for example if they have millions of dollars but in bitcoin how do they convert it back to dollars or do they not convert it uh well i mean uh with with Gitcoin, you actually donate in crypto, so you don't need to convert it into dollars. You maybe kind of convert it from Bitcoin into some other kind of crypto, uh, but that's that's easy to do. What once once you're inside the crypto ecosystem, it all becomes much easier. It's kind of getting inside it. There's a little bit of a hurdle to jump over. So, um, but if you crypto... if you want to, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, so tell me. If if you want to convert Bitcoin into dollars, you just sell it. So you sell it for dollars. Okay. And um, what about the other players in the ecosystem? So are they just initiatives like this, like that just make money out of nothing? Or what they think they're money or like, they basically they're tokens, right? They're like yeah. fungible tokens. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So they just make them out of nothing. Yes. So, for example, there, there's a cryptocurrency called Dogecoin, which was like a joke. Like they literally made it as a joke. It's just a copy of Bitcoin, um, and it was all it all it was and all it is is a picture of a dog. So it's a picture of uh, one of these Japanese Doge dogs, and it has no utility value whatsoever. And for some reason it became valuable people started trading it and sending it to each other as part of the joke but it, it just became it kind of got a value and then once it's got a value people start speculating on it and then it becomes valuable and uh and then elon musk got into it and he loves it and that, that there's absolutely it doesn't do anything i mean once it's valuable you can pay people with it so then then it really is useful but I mean, there's there's been millions of no, not millions, but there's been hundreds of cryptocurrencies that were invented, and nobody used them, and they just went away. You know, they maybe still exist, but no, nobody started using it. Um, so know, what's they, so they what's just... the secret? So what's the secret for getting a cryptocurrency used versus not used? Well, for example, um, Ethereum uh, had had a use, so. It's this kind of decentralized computer where you can uh, use the blockchain to run kind of applications on it. And so that actually is useful. Um, and so people started using it to, in order to use the computer. And then this, this became, this meant uh, the speculators then see like, oh, that's actually being used. And then they um, start speculating on it, that raises the value. And then all of a sudden it's worth something. You know, so, um, mm. so yeah, I mean, if, if you actually go into this, it, it becomes like, what is value? You know, like, why, why is a dollar worth something? I mean, a dollar is essentially worth something because um, you have to pay your taxes in it. And if you don't pay your taxes in it, men with guns come around and put you in a prison cell, you know, so 
that's why a dollar is worth something essentially that that's kind of backing up like a dollar because a dollar a dollar is not is not exchangeable for for anything directly like it used to be like one dollar is worth x amount of gold but it's it's not anymore you know the, okay it's just because i, never I think find about this it stuff, you know? yeah i i find it hard actually to to conceptualize it in terms of a dollar is way is worth something rather than i don't know this cup is worth a dollar yeah <laughs> yeah you but know, the, the thing I, is... for me i mean things are worth uh, the currency not the currency is worth something so yeah i'm trying to wrap my mind around that yeah th things things are only worth what someone's willing to pay for it so the people that had yeah. thousands of Bitcoin on their computer probably thought, I mean, there's a case where this guy threw away uh, a hard drive with $37 million worth of Bitcoin on it. That is worth $37 million now. But when he threw it away, it was worth zero. And he thought this Bitcoin thing's never going to catch on. I'll just throw this hard drive away. And now it's worth $37 million. And he's trying he's trying to get it's in a landfill he knows which landfill it's in it's in england near manchester he's trying to get it out of the landfill because it's worth 37 million and he said to the people who are helping him get it out of the landfill if you help me get it out it's like buried beneath like you know thousands of tons of rubbish um and he said if you help me get it out and i manage to get the bitcoin off it obviously i'll pay you with the 37 million dollars that i'm going to have um yeah it's completely crazy you know, and I think part part of this whole crypto thing is actually embracing the fact of how crazy it is. But in, in a way, it's like if you really think about what value is, you get into some very philosophical conversations very quickly, actually. So, you know, why why is why is anything worth anything? You know, because somebody wants it. That's all. Yeah. If nobody wants it, it's worth zero. Okay. And, and many cryptocurrencies are worth zero because nobody wants also, it. Also, also, yeah, also because somebody wants it, it's exchangeable because yeah. I might want, you know, my mother's dress, but yeah, it's just has sentimental well, value for me and maybe my yeah. mother, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, the, the thing is, from what I saw, like um but because i've been doing a bit of like reading on various re refi for example region yeah. network like on yeah. regions what are yeah. regions and what they're trying to do so basically in refi these tokens normal i mean they should sort of they're sort of backed by something right it's not just from thin air they mean something yeah yes it depends so it depends on the mean... cryptocurrency for example, there, there okay. are cryptocurrencies that are backed by solar power. So when, when somebody is generating power with their solar panels, it's, uh, it's recognizing how much has been generated by their panels. And then they get a certain amount of cryptocurrency that is strictly in accordance with how much solar power they've generated. So in that case, the currency is literally backed by solar power. But others okay. are not backed by anything. Oh, okay. Uh, that's interesting. Because in on long-term value, I would say that the ones that, that are backed by something have more stable value than the ones that just nothing. That, that, that is true. But um, because of the element of speculation, speculators tend to stay away from things that are not going to quickly go up in value a lot. And so things like this solar token, there's been some speculation, but it's the value has been relatively low because what, what speculators want is something which they can invest $10 in, and then a month later it's worth $10,000. And if, if, if it's actually backed by something, then that probably isn't going to happen. It's going to stay relative to the value of the thing it's actually backed at. But I mean, okay. you know, speculators can speculators can do what they want. You know, like we can use crypto for other things. We can use crypto in a more 
in a in a more ecological way, in a more cooperative way. So, if you do, if you don't think this must make me rich in you know six months, then you can do it in a different way. Okay. Yeah, that's. I think that's very useful um, framing for this whole thing because otherwise, I mean, you just want to know about crypto. Why do you want to know about crypto? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, and, thank and you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think if, if as long as we don't pretend that all crypto is the same, you know, as long as we don't pretend that it's all good or it's all bad, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's many, many types. I mean. You know, any any programmer who knows that the relevant programming language can make a new cryptocurrency tomorrow, you know, and it might have very regenerative properties or not, you know, might have very degenerative properties. So what what about do seeds? Do do you know do you know is seeds? Does it have anything? Is it backed by something or is it just? Um, seeds is not backed by no seeds is not backed by anything. Um, we're actually working on on a new version of seeds that will be more backed by regeneration. So seeds is actually carbon negative, um, so it's not it's not degenerative, and the sort of the way it's designed is not it doesn't encourage speculation, uh, but it's not directly backed by anything. But um, so how yeah, the, we are, how does we are that work? On a new Why? Um, so how, how does that work? So it, are there, is there a fixed quantity of seeds? Um, no, uh, seeds, no. seeds has this, um, seeds is kind of in transition. So I'll talk about the old version of seeds, uh, but seeds, um, has a fixed quantity until it reaches a certain value, which is decided by the community. And when it reaches that value, then it becomes um, like an expanding and contracting quantity in order to keep the value stable. So, okay. so it's, it's fixed like a normal, let's say normal cryptocurrency until it reaches a value that the community says, okay, that's a useful value for us to use as a stable value. So that could be one cent, 10 cents, $1 relative to US dollar, for example. Um, and, then, and then after that, um, this thing called the harvest protocol is switched on and then that will uh, destroy seeds if the value goes down and it and it will make more seeds if the if the value goes up so if the value goes up okay. if it goes too high then you create more seeds which kind of floods the market and then the value goes down to the required level if if there's so what... if there's too few then you let then you let the value go back up oh, okay okay and who who gets I mean who gets to decide how seeds distributed? I mean who has the uh, seeds? Somebody created them, and then who 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 owns those seeds? At, at the moment, it's managed by the Seeds Commons, so that's like a group of volunteers, basically. So um, a, a lot of the seeds were given out to regenerative projects. So um, and what do they do? Regenerative projects. What do they do with those seeds? Uh, pay people to plant trees, for example, that kind of thing. Yeah, but if, do they do they have to exchange it in fiat currency? It, it depends. Like if, if you're in a community where everyone's getting paid in seeds, then you might decide to just use seeds. You, know, you might decide so that, we don't that, need to change it back to be, fiat currency. Okay, so those would be like maybe echo villages. Yeah. So if you're in a, if you're in an echo village, everyone's like, getting everyone's getting paid in seeds okay. and the whole project has received a massive donation of seeds and maybe they get shared out among everybody then maybe you decide well we don't need fiat currency you know we, we'll just pay okay. each other in in seeds and we don't okay. need to convert it to dollars especially if you're in a country where the let's say venezuela where the currency is very volatile and very unstable you might decide you're better off with seeds than you know using their money but then for exchanges with the outside, yeah, they need to use the fiat. Uh, yes, so that that depends on seeds having um, an exchangeable sort of value with the outside world, basically, which is why the, the supply is still limited. No, at the moment, okay. 
it doesn't okay. no it's this is why we're sort of redesigning it because it, it does have some oh, value okay. to the outside world but you, you need many thousands of seeds to get any sort of you know fiat money at the moment mm -hmm. um but previously it was i think seeds were worth maybe 20 cents each something like that i, I may be getting that wrong but they, they were worth you know something in that sort of ballpark um and now they're worth maybe less than a penny so yeah but i mean okay. with any cryptocurrency yeah, you can use it between people if they agree that it's worth something and then yeah you know yeah 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 because it's about the community within which the the the, the currency is functioning because that's with any currency you know yeah. the currency is about a community yeah and the flows within that community yeah exactly okay yeah thank you that that okay. was useful um you know there was this document that came this week and i i i was part of it and there was one case study it's about regenerative funding governance and it was on haifa and seeds yeah and it was done by anna luce uh smithsman yeah. mm -hmm. uh you know her um yeah. but i i sort of understood what haifa is but i didn't understood i, I didn't understand seeds from that case study and i think maybe because it's like redesigned as it says it's like it's not it's that's not in its final version yet no no but i i think i think we will yeah. be uh coming out with uh with the next version quite soon at least um starting to sort of re-energize the project and get people using seeds again and get the sort of relative okay. value back up to something usable so i think it soon it will be it'll be more of a usable currency for sure okay okay yep thank you okay i'm Thanks, Paula, for coming, and uh, hope it was useful, and thanks a lot. Yeah, definitely, yes. Okay. Bye.